Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Rati Jani. I'm a senior lecturer in nutrition and dietetics at Griffith University. And today I'll be taking your guest lecture on global nutrition challenges to meet sustainable developmental goal. The short form is SDGs. Uh, and specifically, we'll be talking about SDGs 2, which is zero hunger. All right, so what will this lecture be covering? Um, as I mentioned that we will be talking specifically about global nutrition challenges that are facing the SDGs to zero hunger. So what exactly is zero hunger? It is ending hunger and achieving food security and improving nutrition and promoting sustainable agriculture. So yes, there are many sustainable developmental goals and we are particularly looking at the one which is focusing on food, nutrition and food security. We will be looking at a snapshot of data, which is um, indicating specific things in relation to this topic. We will be looking at that we are not unfortunately on track with the global nutrition targets of 2025. The global nutrition targets have now been extended to 2030 uh, because of COVID and various other global calamities that we have faced. Therefore, the global nutrition targets that were set to be achieved by 2025, they are now being decided to be achieved by 2030. We will also be seeing data which indicates that our diets are increasingly harming our health and the planet. The financial cost of addressing poor diets and malnutrition has risen. We will also look at uh, the data which shows that the impact of COVID-19 on food security and the impact of conflict, especially we are talking about uh, war-induced conflict, civil wars, all right, and their impact on food insecurity. So these are the key things that we will be covering in today's lecture. Moving further. So yes, uh, it's very important first to know what are the global nutrition targets before we start talking about how we unfortunately are not on track on achieving them. So this slide summarizes what are the global nutrition targets. Sustainable developmental goals are, especially the number two, SDG number two, zero hunger, is aiming to meet these global nutrition targets by the year 2030, now that the extension has been received. So I'll just tell you in brief what these uh, targets are, but you can find out more about the sustainable developmental goals and these, which is global nutrition targets, in this website, SDG website, which is a sustainable developmental goal website. So yes, there are 17 uh, major goals out there and each goal has smaller subsections. We are focusing on the one which are related to nutrition. All right, so yes, the global nutrition targets, number one, what is the target? Which is uh, to reduce the number of children who are stunted by, by 40%. And these children are under five children, all right? So that is one of the global targets that we have. Second target is to reduce anemia in women of reproductive age by 50%. Target number three is reduce um, low birth weight by 30%. All right, target number four is there should be no further increase in childhood obesity. And this is a target that the world has set to achieve by 2030. All right, so I'll just keep reminding you, we have these great big ambitious target um, that the world has promised to deliver. Um, and then we'll see the report card of what is happening till date. Okay, then we have um, moving on further is to increase exclusive breastfeeding. And when we talk about exclusive breastfeeding, it is up to the age of six months. All right, yes, so the rate of breastfeeding should be at least 50%, uh, that is what the target is. Then uh, we have, um, which is reduce wasting, all right, reduce and maintain childhood wast wasting to less than 5%, meaning less than 5% of the children hopefully um, would be experiencing wasting, no more than that. So that is the ambitious target that we have. Then we have specific targets which are for adults in terms of non-communicable diseases. All right, so the first one is to um, reduce the salt or the sodium intake. And this would be on average uh, for the population uh, by 30%. Then it is to reduce the rise in high blood pressure. 
All right, uh, this would be on average for 25% all right, of the world population. Then we have um, adult of overweight and obesity. So which is to stop any further rise in adult overweight and obesity. And uh, this is again to be um, hopefully met by 2030. So yes, you can read much more about these targets in this website, which is provided sustainable developmental goals. All right, and yes, these are the main global nutrition targets for 2030. So yes, now moving on further, the first data that we are looking at is indicating that we are not on track with the global nutrition targets. And now you know in brief what the global nutrition targets are and what I'm referring to. All right, so yes, um, ideally they were to be met by 2025, but now we have an extension to 2030 because of the various pandemic and various calamities that the world experienced. Um, the leaders of the world united and they agreed that we need a bit more of time to achieve these targets. All right, so Global Nutrition Report, uh, what does it do? This is a document which provides you a snapshot or you can say a report card on where we are up to in meeting and delivering the global nutrition targets. All right, so specifically it provides data on the state of diet and nutrition around the world. And when we say around the world, when I keep on referring to globally, what does this mean? It means that 194 countries have participated as part of this global nutrition target program and to meet and achieve these targets. So whenever I say globally, we are referring to these 194 countries. All right, then the uh, Global Nutrition Report, um, yes, it is supported, um, it is published annually, uh, which is every year it is published, it is supported by the World Health Organization, and the most recent Global Nutrition Report on the report card of how we are tracking along to meet the global nutrition targets is released, and this is the 2021 Global Nutrition Report, and you have a very um, small and a good snapshot video um, showing you the main highlights about the global nutrition targets, which we will be talking about in detail, but let's have a look at the video, which will give you a good overview into things further. All right, so I'll just play the video for you, so bear with me. I'll maximize the screen, and here I go. We are facing a global nutrition crisis. Poor diets and resulting malnutrition in all its forms continue to be unacceptably high across the world. Now diets are increasingly harming our health and the planet. Unhealthy diets are now responsible for over a quarter of all adult deaths every year. And global food demand is now creating more than a third of global greenhouse emissions. Despite some progress, the current pace of change is too slow in almost all countries. And financial costs of addressing poor diets and malnutrition are rising, while resources are projected to fall. But the costs of an action are far greater. The need for bolder, sustained and coordinated action on nutrition has never been greater. This fight is winnable. In this nutrition year of action, we need stronger commitments greater accountability and systematic monitoring to accelerate progress and ensure we stay on track. With a step change in efforts and financial investments, we can end poor diets and malnutrition to enable healthy populations, prosperous economies, and a sustainable planet. Find out more in the 2021 Global Nutrition Report, out now. All right, so I hope this was a good snapshot, um, a good overview about the Global Nutrition Report. And of course, in the coming slide, we'll be looking at the Global Nutrition Report a bit more in detail. All right, so yes, um, as the um, video was saying that what is the overall trend? The overall trend is indicating that most of the countries, they are not meeting the Global Nutrition Target. We are not on track and we are not um, confident that we will be able to meet this target by 2025 and therefore the extension to 2030. Uh, so what are, the key, um, what are the key report card indicators? Worldwide, um, the, the Global Nutrition Target Report says that 149 million children under five years of age are stunted. 
right? Um, the report also says that 45.4 million children are wasted and 38.9 million children are overweight. So yes, big numbers out there. Overall, in nutshell, the summary is that currently we are not on track, we are not on course to meet these targets. If you look at the uh, report card in detail, you will see that you will see uh, this uh, figure in the main report card and all of the references are provided for your perusal at the last, at the, in the end of the presentation. But yes, if you see this orange color uh, mark, students, this one indicates that majority of the countries are not meeting the global nutrition target. So let's look at the example of anemia. Only one country is on course. So one country hopefully will meet the global nutrition target of anemia, which is reduce anemia in women of reproductive age by 50%. This target hopefully will be met only by one country, all right, by the year 2025 or now with an extension of 2030. Rest of the countries, 193 countries, they are not on track and it doesn't seem like the target will be met, all right? So similar sort of um, say reports have been given for low birth weight, childhood wasting, breastfeeding, childhood overweight and stunting. And as you see, majority of the figures show that the orange color area is more. More orange color area meaning more countries are not on course to meet the global nutrition target. All right. Now we go on to the other global nutrition target, the one which we saw on the first slide, which is in relationship to non-communicable diseases. So what does Global Nutrition Report say? That 2.2 billion people are overweight and obese. This accounts for nearly 40% of the world population. So nearly 40% of the world population, adult population, is overweight or obese. No country is on course to halt the rise of adult obesity. No country is on course to rise the halt of um, excessive salt intake. So if you remember the global nutrition target in the first slide, what did we say? That the target was halt the prevalence and the rise of adult overweight and obesity. Meaning after 2030, we shouldn't have anybody who is trending as overweight and obese. Obviously, no country is on track for that. What was the other thing which the global nutrition target said? that salt intake, um, there should be um, relatively say 30% decrease in the salt consumption overall globally. But this does not look that this would happen very soon. All right, so this is, uh, this is the sort of say um, status indicators that the Global Nutrition Report releases every year for us to know if we are on track or not. Moving further, another point over here is very important that the Global Nutrition Report highlights is that currently our diets are increasingly harming our health and the planet. We'll first talk about health in the coming slide and then we'll talk about the planet. So what is the main indicator over here in this slide? No country is meeting the recommendation for healthy diet. And basically what does this figure say? How, how do you interpret this figure? This figure tells us that 61% of the countries globally, they are not meeting the recommendation of consuming um, whole grains, all right? And North America, 81% of, say, the population in North America, they are not meeting the recommendations of whole grain intake. So globally, 61%. And North America or United States is far exceeding in not meeting the recommendations of consuming whole grains. And the students over here, please be mindful, we are talking about whole grains. Um, whole grains is like, such as like your wholemeal flour, your multigrain bread, um, barley, things like that. All right, we are not talking about just uh, people in US not consuming enough breads and cereals. No, we are not talking about refined breads and cereals. We are talking about whole grain breads and cereals as an example, all right? Similarly, globally, 60% of the regions are not meeting the recommendation of consuming the number of fruits that they are supposed to be consuming. And within this, Asia is exceeding the global percentage. So majority of the population or regions in Asia, uh, the continent of Asia, 
they are not meeting the recommended intake of fruits. Now, further, similarly, 40% of the global population are not meeting the recommended intake of vegetable intake. All right. Within this, Africa is exceeding in numbers, meaning their consumption of um, vegetables is much more lower compared to the global population. Okay. Now, on the contrary, unfortunately, the consumption of discretionary food items. What do I mean by discretionary food items? In simple words, junk food, unhealthy food. All right, your cake, pizza, um, and pastries, and chocolates, and lollies, and colas, soft drinks, sugar sweetened beverages, all of that. So yes, within this context, globally, we as a, we as a nation, we as um, a planet, we are exceeding the recommendations or the limits of how much we should be consuming discretionary food by 377%, all right? Way, way above. So a lot more consumption than what is recommended that do not have junk food more than X number of um, times in a day or X number of times in a week. So these are the sort of recommendations we are having more than that, 377% more than that as a planet, all right? And within this percentages, Oceania regions are having far more intake of discretionary food, 740 times more percentage intake of discretionary foods. And what do I mean by Oceania regions? Oceania regions are, for example, your Samoa, Tonga, all of these Pacific Islander regions, all right? So I hope this makes sense. So yes, what is the take home message, the conclusion? No region is meeting the recommendations for healthy diet, all right? Now these recommendations, for example, for Australia, for the consumption of fruit and veg are two fruits and five veggies, all right? So these are the type of recommendations we are talking about. Um, as Australians, we should be consuming every day at least two fruits and five veggies. Similarly, you have recommendations all over uh, the world for various countries. So yes, a united as a whole, um, as a planet, we are not meeting these recommendations which are set for our own countries. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. So now moving further. So what are these diets doing to us? All right, how um, harming health. So what is the indicator which is showing that our diets are increasingly harming our health. Well, the report shows um, the data on deaths which are attributed to poor diets, right? So what does this say? It says that nearly more than 12 million, right? 12 million non-communicable disease deaths are attributed to poor diet. What do I mean by non-communicable disease? These diseases are, for example, diseases of, of, such as obesity, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, cancers, all of these, all right? So 12 million deaths, um, which are pertaining to non-communicable diseases are because of poor diet. So these are diet-related diseases, all right? Type 2 diabetes, obesity, a lot of many type of cancers, cardiovascular diseases. These are preventable diseases in majority of the cases when you look at from an epidemiological level. So yes, these 12 million of these deaths are because of poor diets, all right? And when we talk about um, deaths due to poor diet, the proportion of deaths because of poor diet, this is highest in North America, meaning the dietary patterns which are followed in North America and Europe. These have higher deaths because of poor diet and Deaths because of poor diet is lowest in a region such as Africa, all right? So this is what it shows. It shows that premature death, meaning if a person ideally would have lived healthily, uh, but because of uh, poor dietary lifestyle choices, these individuals uh, may experience death much more earlier in their life. So this is premature death, which we are talking about. So yes, at an epidemiological level, dietary patterns which are followed in Western nations such as um, America and Europe, they, the death rate is attributed higher in those regions because of poor diet compared to regions such as Africa. 
But what is the take home message? Um, conclusion, no region is on course to meet sustainable developmental goal, which is reduce premature mortality or mortality meaning death from non-communicable diseases. And now you know what the non-communicable diseases are, all right? So I hope this is very clear and this is appalling because it shows us directly how poor death can, is associated with mortality rate, all right? Okay, so now um, the global report also gives us some uh, highlights of how our diets are increasingly harming the planet, all right? So data shows that global food demand is now creating more than a third, which is 35% of all greenhouse emissions. And this is something which was also reported in the video, which we saw before, all right? So yes, um, so what? Um, how much has been the global food demand increase? Food demand has increased by as much as 14% since 2010, all right? So the population is increasing, more population, more food demand. This is leading to higher greenhouse gas emissions. All right, now when we look at um, the food sources, animal sources of food, they are responsible for the majority of the greenhouse emissions and land use. When we talk about animal sources of food, for example, when um, you have um, animals which are bred and which are reared for uh, meat purposes, for example, cattle for meat. All right, so this is what it's talking about. Again, Northern American diets, they have the greatest environmental impact compared to diets which are from the African region, all right? And then again, what is the take-home message? The take-home message is this, which is no region in the world or no country in the world is on course to meet the sustainable developmental goal number two, which is um, limiting the burden, which um, say um, the food system has on environment, okay? So I hope this gives you a very strong snapshot of uh, the, me, the main and the key nutrition challenges that we are facing as a planet as a whole and how it is impacting our health, how it is impacting the planet, all right? Now the report also shows that the financial cost of addressing poor diets and malnutrition unfortunately has worsened. And one of the key determinants of the greater financial burden is COVID. Okay, so this gives a very good example over here. So for example, if we want to meet our global nutrition targets of say, of addressing stunting, basting, anemia, increasing the rates of breastfeeding by 2030, all right? So if we want to meet this target, previously, before COVID, the world needed Say for instance, US dollar 7 billion annually, all right? So every year we needed, this is the sort of a budget to meet these indicators, to meet this target. But now after COVID, after, after the world has experienced the impact of COVID, we need $10.8 billion annually to account for the impact of COVID, all right? Here in the second example, it shows that specifically to meet sustainable developmental goal number two, which is of our interest because it is closest, it is related to nutrition challenges. So to meet SDG twos, we need approximately 39 to 50 billion um, US dollars annually. All right, so that's a very, very big budget. Okay, however, hypothetically speaking, all right, if say we were to meet this target by 2030, meaning now the world has um, say, met its target of, um, say, reducing stunting, basting, increasing breastfeeding, reducing the um, level of anemia among women of reproductive age, if we meet this target by 2030, then the world, then the planet will see economic gains. How come we'll see economic gains? You'll have less morbidity, you will have less mortality, you'll have less impact on the governmental system, on the healthcare system. So a lot of money will be saved. And this money saved is what is, is global gain. So how much are we um, estimating what the economic gains will be from meeting these targets? Hypothetically, by 2030, it will be 5.7 trillion US dollars by 2030 and 10.5 trillion US dollars by 2050. 
So yes, the world will see a lot of economic benefits and gains if we were to meet this global targets by 2030. But as you have seen the report card for 2021, it's um, quite tough. All right, let's just say it's quite challenging. And therefore the lecture on nutrition challenges. Okay, so yes, now let's look at closely the impact of COVID. Very important guys, why I wanted to select COVID and uh, conflict um, induced um, food insecurity is because these are the two most hot topic. And when I talk about hot topic, not something gossipy in nature, but what I am referring to is these are the two most critical things which we as a united front, as citizens of this planet are experiencing. All of us have experienced impact of COVID in some way or the other directly or indirectly. And all of us now are also experiencing war like we never did before, all right? And yes, we will be touching base upon the Ukraine-Russia war in this lecture as well, all right? So we are looking at the most up-to-date scenario of what are the nutrition challenges because of um, the big, uh, big experiences, big biomarkers um, or big um, unfortunate events in simple terms that the world has, has to face. All right. So yes, COVID-19 is um, unprecedented, the biggest barrier that we will be facing in meeting our SDGs too. All right. So what has the impact of COVID shown? Because of COVID, 161 million more people are facing hunger in 2020 than they were facing in 2019, all right, which is before COVID hit, all right? So do you see this little spike over here on this figure? If you see my mouse where it's hovering, this is showing that within one year, within a single span of one year, we have 161 people more um, uh, individuals who are facing hunger, who are facing food insecurity. What more biggest nutrition challenge can we face as a world? All right. It is not that in previous years we haven't had people who have experienced hunger. We have always had ups and downs. But in a single span of a year, so many more people who are exposed, who are vulnerable to food insecurity, this has been the biggest in many, many, many decades. All right, so this has been the impact of COVID on food insecurity, on, on being one of the biggest risk factors for nutrition challenges, okay? And then when we talk about food insecurity, majority of this, which is say 418 million people in the world are affected by um, hunger as we have seen in 2020. These are residing in Asia and the second biggest population, 282 million are residing in Africa. So yes, these are the two biggest regions in the world who are facing food insecurity, who are experiencing hunger in 2020. Okay, This paper um, very well distinguishes and highlights few example case study of, of various countries and, its, uh, and the impact of COVID. So for instance, if we take the example of Kenya. So in Kenya, before COVID, before COVID hit, um, household food insecurity was experienced by 50% of the population. Now, after COVID, post COVID, which is in April, 2020 is when the data was collected. Household food insecurity was experienced by 88% of the population. And this is what the table is telling you. It's giving you indicators pre and post COVID of various countries in Africa, in Mexico, and in Asia as an example of Bangladesh, okay? So I hope uh, this uh, makes some sense and is clear and you can appreciate the impact of COVID in a very, very short span. A very big impact at a pandemic level in a very short span, which has been a biggest challenge in terms of nutrition, all right? So now uh, when we see the impact of COVID on food price and income in inequality. So yes, unfortunately because of COVID, what has happened is healthy diet has become more expensive, all right? But our purchasing power has gone down. Yes, uh, healthy diets, for example, in simple terms, if you go to Coles and Woolworths, uh, fruits and vegetables um, became 
much more expensive after COVID. But unfortunately, our income did not increase. All right. It's not that we, we all started earning more money. We all started saving more money. And therefore, we could afford these um, healthy diets. No. Uh, healthy diets, prices increased, income levels decreased, or income levels stayed stagnant depending upon people and their situation or income level completely stopped for a lot more people. And therefore around 3 billion people are unable to afford healthy diets. And this data is from 2019, not so long ago, all right? 3 billion people is nearly 41.9% of the world population, okay? So we are talking about 41.9% of the world population who cannot afford healthy diets in 2019, all right? And what has been, say, the um, per day cost of healthy diet? The per day cost of healthy diet has increased by 7.9%. So it was, uh, from 2017 to 2019, there has been an increase of 7.9% in how much healthy diet cost, okay? So what is the healthy diet cost? And we are talking about globally over here. It is 4.04 um, US dollars per person per day. And this is an increase of $7.9, okay? So yes, a, a big increase in say, how much food prices have gone up, how much healthy diets cost us. But unfortunately, purchasing power of people did not go up. For um, some people, it was stagnant. Um, for some people, uh, there was no income, unfortunately. And this has caused 41.9% of people around the world to not afford healthy eating. Okay, so I hope um, you can appreciate the impact of COVID on uh, food prices. Okay, so what has been other impact of um, nutrition challenge because of COVID? The other nutrition challenge because of COVID has been nutrition intervention, delivering nutrition intervention so here what this graph is trying to tell you is that there, when we talk about nutrition intervention in this context, um, students, what I'm referring to is systems level nutrition intervention. All right. When I say systems level is, for example, a governments of various countries that have, um, that have launched various nutrition interventions and programs to support the vulnerable community within that country. All right, and we'll be talking about a few specific nutrition interventions um, in further slides to give you a much better idea. But here I want to highlight the data. So what does the data show? The data shows that 90% of the countries and which is um, the data was available from 135 countries. So mind you, yes, um, we have 194 countries which are participating in meeting the global nutrition targets, but the data which was available on nutrition interventions was um, on 135 countries when the data was collected, okay? Um, so yes, what does it show? That 90% of the countries, they reported that they have seen a decrease, a halt, some sort of a change. This change is not improvement. This change is a regression, okay? It's not progression, it is regression. So they have seen a change in the coverage of nutrition services that they could deliver, all right? And this data is from August 2020, so yes. Uh, 135 countries uh, provided data in August 2020, and they showed that they have seen a decline of some sort and capacity in the nutrition services that they could deliver. All right. Overall, essential nutrition coverage and services and interventions or programs, um, they had seen a decline of 40%. All right. And nearly half of the countries, um, they saw a drop in at least one nutrition intervention, okay? So maybe a country is running 15 or 20 nutrition programs um, across various states, and of these, at least one nutrition program had been impacted, okay? And a decline of at least, um, say, 40% was seen. Okay, the majority of the impact on nutrition services and programs um, that were reported were a decline in Asia and a decline in Africa. Okay, so in Africa, it was a decline of 27% and in Asia, 49% of the nutrition services that were delivered had seen a decline, a change. Okay, in this graph, 
I know you cannot see this clearly, uh, students, but please be mindful. All of the references to this has been provided in your last slide. And also, I do have this habit of reporting all of my references in the notes section of these PowerPoints. Okay, so when you have these PowerPoints, if you see the notes section of this PowerPoint, you will see the references as well, in which you will have um, access to all of this full data. Okay, so here, if you see um, um, students, something which is not of our surprise is that the largest drop in nutrition services were the nutrition programs which were delivered in school. All right, so in schools, you can see the largest drop. So this red color drop. So 75 to 100 percent drops were seen in the nutrition programs that were delivered in school. What sort of nutrition programs are delivered at school? I will definitely give you an example of this in the coming slides. Okay, so now we'll go on further. Yeah. So now what has been the impact of COVID on mortality and morbidity? So first we'll look at mortality. So yes, uh, the reports, the global reports indicate that uh, 1.8 million people unfortunately have died because of the COVID-19 pandemic, all right? But World Health Organization, latest data shows that 1.8 is an underreporting. World Health Organization says that at least 3 million people, they have lost their lives because of the COVID-19 pandemic, okay? So yes, unfortunately, there has been grave impact on lives lost because of the COVID-19 pandemic globally, right? Now, in terms of uh, morbidity, what does the data show? So when we look at uh, global data, research tells us that COVID-19 is experienced 1.5 times higher in individuals who are experiencing obesity, which is with a BMI of over 30 kg per meter square, all right? And the data from the CDC, okay? So Centers of Disease Control, and this is data from United States. So data on adults shows that adults who are admitted to hospital, and this data is from December 2019 to November 2020, 30% of these adults who were admitted to hospital within this time frame, uh, and they were admitted because they were um, suffering from COVID-19 and experiencing grave symptoms of COVID-19, 30% of these individuals um, were obese. Okay, so obesity could be attributed to hospitalization because of COVID, all right, and 30% of these individuals. In children, what does the data shows? The data shows that uh, children who are experiencing obesity, they are three times um, at a higher risk of hospitalization and 1.4 times at a higher risk of severe illnesses. And this means admission to the ICUs, invasive ventilation techniques. It could be, say, for example, when you are uh, ventilating directly in the uh, trachea, which is creating a hole in the, um, say, in the throat. And then it could also be uh, lives which are lost because of um, obesity. All right, so what is the take home message over here? The take home message is that obesity and individuals who have other diet related chronic health disorders. And we uh, spoke about diet related chronic health disorders, such as your type 2 diabetes and your, um, say, obesity and your uh, cardiovascular diseases, various cancers, so on and so forth. These individuals are more vulnerable, susceptible to COVID 19. And therefore, the conclusion is that yes. COVID-19 has definitely added in a very big challenge for us to meet the global nutrition targets. Okay, so one of the biggest nutrition challenge is for us to overcome the impacts of COVID-19 and get on back on track to meet our global nutrition targets. Okay. All right, so moving on further. Uh, what has uh, UNICEF suggested. So UNICEF has suggested certain strategies, certain recommendations for us to gradually address the impact of COVID-19 associated nutrition challenges. So what are the recommendations of UNICEF uh, within the context of COVID-19? The first recommendation is to develop guidelines and SOPs, which is statement of purpose for nutrition programs in the context of COVID-19. Okay, so for instance, an example has been given over here. Uh, so uh, 
Over here, I'll uh, share with you that a lot of, uh, in a lot of developing countries, and this example is for Nepal, and the same sort of uh, program is also followed in India, which is the origin from where I come from. All right, so we have midday meals running in a lot of schools in Nepal, in India. All right, so what are midday meals? Midday meals are a nutrition program, nutrition service, which is provided by the government to, to all of the governmental schools in India. And for a lot of children, students who are attending the school, midday meal could be the only meal which the child is eating because there is um, no food at home or there is, um, or there could be say gender inequality or if there is food, um, it's prioritized to uh, be given to the male child and the female child. So many other socio-cultural determinants and challenges, many um, other say complex issues. But yes, so midday meal, if we come on back to uh, the point, midday meal is provided by the government. It is say, um, say over here, you know how we have a lunch break and um, then you have your lunch. So midday meal is say a lunch program, which is provided by the governments. And it is a meal which ensures that it is nutritionally balanced. It has enough amount of a good quality and good quantity that the child is meeting X amount of its nutritional requirement. Of course, you cannot meet all of the nutritional requirement in one midday meal. Uh, so that is not the purpose. The purpose is um, say sustenance that the child is surviving um, in a decent and a healthy state. So this example over here shows you that in Nepal, because of COVID, as we know that the food prices increased, which we saw in the previous slide, uh, but unfortunately the purchasing power did not. And therefore the quality and the quantity of foods which were provided in the school lunch program in Nepal, uh, they, uh, they decreased, meaning the caloric content of the lunch program decreased, the amount of micronutrients which were there in this uh, meals which were provided in the school, they decreased such as calcium and iron and zinc, protein content decrease. So this graph is providing you that indicator, all right? So yes, unfortunately, this is a true scenario. Um, in a lot of cases, midday meal were completely stopped because children stopped going to schools because of COVID and this rampant malnutrition in a lot of cases. In other cases, um, if children were going to school, if it was safe to go to school, unfortunately, the schools could not afford to give uh, the type and the quality and the amount of meal that they were giving previously. So that decreased, all right? So this is the challenge. And that's why UNICEF is recommending that let us start uh, coming together, brainstorming strategies and ideas as to how do we restart our nutrition program at a national level, at a community level, right? Okay. The second UNICEF recommendation is that develop appropriate health messages which are simple, easy to understand, and which are addressing the myths and misconceptions around nutrition and COVID. So for instance, there was this um, big um, thing which was uh, going on uh, when I was um, visiting um, India. And uh, uh, yes, uh, when I was visiting India, when just... Uh, during uh, the time COVID started and we could still um, say fly international and then everything stopped. During that time, uh, the rumor was that if you eat whole foods, uh, this uh, causes COVID or this increases your risk of COVID. All right, so cold foods are like banana and yogurt and things like that. But of course, as we know and we can appreciate, this is not true. So yes, UNICEF is recommending um, countries around the world to develop simple health messages so that people uh, can understand that they, these are myths and misconceptions. And if the food is available, if these healthy foods are available, such as banana and yogurt, and you can afford it, then please eat it. Or if they are provided by government in rations and in subsidized rates, then please eat it, okay? Then the other recommendation from UNICEF is to establish hotlines for nutrition counseling. So not all nutrition programs and services need to be delivered face-to-face. Uh, -face. Um, this can be done. As we know, COVID has taught us new ways of learning and teaching. That's why we have this online lecture rather than me coming to you and giving you a lecture in class. All right, so yes. So um, the government is recommending uh, nations around the world that even nutrition services and nutrition education, nutrition counseling now should um, opt for a different platform, which is, for example, you could have, say, 
lactation management and consultation done over the phone or online. Okay. Then UNICEF is uh, recommending to explore um, the opportunity for partnerships for funding and for, uh, say, cash transfer to the most vulnerable societies, communities around the world, for example, and vulnerable populations like mothers and children. All right. So, for an example of this is the World Bank. So, the World Bank distributed $20 billion um, dollars, US uh, dollars to 100 developing countries as part of their COVID-19 strategic preparedness and response program. All right. So, yes, in this, what they covered was a vaccination that were delivered to developing countries, uh, then hygiene and sanitation packages such as masks and gloves that were delivered to developing countries, PPE that were delivered to developing countries. And a lot more details about this uh, World Bank, um, say, uh, funding distribution can be found in this website. Right? Okay, so yes, UNICEF is also recommending to explore innovative ways to provide nutrition services all right, while observing, of course, COVID safety protocols. And this website provides you um, fantastic examples of the innovative strategies that various governments around the world have already started incorporating um, to um, restart the nutrition services, nutrition programs. All right, one of the um, ones which I'll share with you is the um, iron and folic acid supplementation program. So this is run with the help of UNICEF, with the help of United Nations, uh, WHO, all of them are supporting this and they have these programs that are carried out in various developing countries. The one which is carried out in India, what the Indian government did was uh, when these schools suddenly stopped and uh, the uh, children could not come to schools, uh, what the government did was they trained community workers to go to um, houses for all of these children and deliver these supplementations. So these are iron and folic acid supplementation in form of tablets and a ration of say three months or six months of supplementation by these community workers were delivered um, to um, children in their houses and their parents and their caretakers or their guardians were taught how these children should be consuming these supplementation. For example, with water and with food, so and so. And also encouraging the guardians, um, say, within this context is that these supplementations are meant for the a girl child because the government has started this program for women of reproductive ages young teenagers who have started their uh, menstruation, for example. So this program is, uh, say, for example, from age 11 onwards to children who are attending school, uh, the, uh, say, the girl child who's attending school. And why for uh, females particularly is because, um, as you'll appreciate, in um, certain countries, and I speak for India, uh, girls may be uh, married off um, early in their age, um, as soon as probably when they reach their legal age of 18 years. And therefore, their bodies, if they are undernourished and if they have to go to pregnancy, um, and if they have to go through pregnancy, then this can have appalling and detrimental health effects on their themselves and their child. And therefore, the um, government has um, done this program so that all, um, say, um, female or girl children in reproductive years can be supported. They have enough iron and folic acid stores uh, for their uh, own well health and well-being and for their future pregnancies and um, um, childbearing. Okay, so yes. So this is an innovation which was done by the Indian government that they train community workers uh, to go to households, deliver these supplements and encourage the parents that these supplements are meant for the girl child and for the girl child to have it rather than they giving it out maybe to the boy child or um, say, Sometimes they even sell the supplements to get a few more, um, say, rupees on. And it's, um, and it's, the, and it's a very complex socio-cultural, um, say, paradigm over here. We cannot, it's not, nobody should be blamed for this, but more framework should be provided in, um, in terms of support and assistance. All right, but yes, I hope you can appreciate that this is a fantastic, innovative um, strategy which was done by the Indian government, which is trained community workers to reach them. If the children cannot reach the school, let's reach the children out. Okay. 
Uh, then uh, you have the other units of recommendation is to develop comprehensive nutrition emergency response plan. Uh, this, for example, is the availability and distribution of um, ready to use therapeutic food. So ready to use therapeutic food is something which the government encourages that in, in case if there is say an emergency, a calamity, uh, then if there are these um, RUTF available, this can help address SAMS. What is SAM? SAM is severe acute malnutrition. So what I'm talking about is summarized very well in this YouTube video. So let's have a look at that. I'll just play the video for you. So just bear with me. Food for Famine Society saves the lives of countless malnourished children under five all over the world by giving them ready-to-use therapeutic food, also known as RUTF. RUTF is a ready-to-eat vitamin-enriched peanut paste containing all the nutrients a young child needs. In 2008, Maria from Langley, B.C., Canada, watched a news story about malnutrition. She learned that one child under five years old dies every four seconds. She was appalled at this waste of precious young lives. But then she learned about the solution, ready to use therapeutic food. Maria got excited. A ray of hope. How could I help, she asked. She knew she wanted to do more than just donate money. So a year later, she founded Food for Famine Society. Since its humble beginnings, Food for Famine has delivered thousands of kilograms of RUTF, saving the lives of countless children. It comes in a squeeze packet, easy for a mother to open and easy for a child to eat. All it takes is three squeeze packets a day for four to six weeks to save the life of a child. It needs no water, refrigeration, or preparation. Each packet contains the nutritional value of half a chicken breast, a bunch of spinach, nine asparagus spears, three cups of milk, half a cup of olive oil, one third of a stick of butter, two hamburger patties, one orange, and one and a half carrots. Plus, it tastes good, just like sweetened peanut butter. Here's a simple equation. One box of RUTF equals the life of one child. Here's how you can help. Do what Maria did. Talk to everyone you know about this. So I hope students, um, you can um, appreciate the um, attempt that is made by the government. So yes, this was one of the example that I wanted to share with you is an emergency response plan in terms of nutrition could be the easy availability, accessibility, and affordability of RUTFs, all right? And this is done widely in a lot of developing countries. The other recommendation that UNICEF has is the government should consider scaling up their integrated management of acute malnutrition, IMAM, all right, program to address both the existing and growing burden of wasting. So here I want to share with you an example and we'll see a YouTube video is, a very good example where the government is teaching the mothers or the guardian and the caretaker to screen for malnutrition um, in their um, young children. All right, so they are taught how to use the, um, the color tape to understand um, how their child could be malnourished to identify that correctly, to screen that correctly. So if the mom knows that, yes, uh, my child is uh, wasting, my child is uh, malnourished, what is wasting when the child becomes really skinny, losing a lot of muscle mass, when the child is turning into skin and bones, if the mother is seeing that happening, then the, she can um, start early intervention, she can contact the community centers for support and assistance, all right? So you can only contact for support and assistance if you know that, yes, there is a problem first to face. All right. So therefore, uh, there are uh, governmental organizations who are training the mothers to correctly use the um, band. All right. So what is the band? How does it look? And how is the training done? It's very beautifully summarized in this uh, video. So let me just share that with you. Bear with me.
j'ai fait sensibilisation sur la malnutrition parce que moi, moi j'ai joué une instance qui a pris un en charge. Oui, je suis jeune, je suis qui peut aider, comment je prends soin, parce que je suis à l'hôpital, je suis ensemble avec, mais c'est toujours à dire, mais qui j'aime prendre soin, qui fait. Je suis capable de prendre avec toujours. Il fait mal l'infection. Ils sont signés, ils ne vont pas qu'il y ait des boutons sur le corps, pas fort, ils étaient là, puis les boutons montés sur le corps. L'UNICEF appuie plusieurs partenaires pour l'accompagnement des activités communautaires, notamment la formation de mères leaders qui apprennent le périmètre brachial. Et cette activité, elle le montre également aux mères de la communauté et permet aux mères de faire le suivi nutritionnel de leurs enfants. Chaque matin, je vais aller à la caillou, je montrer au point de périmètre brachial. Donc, là, je vais visiter autour, je faire au point de devant, je vais au périmètre brachial. Je même pas, c'est pas pas me connaître en bas. Je vais me ça par forme carité pour me faire, pour me dire que je vais me faire. Je vais le faire à niveau oui j'ai jaune. Les familles vivent principalement de la pêche, mais ils n'ont que cette seule source d'entrée. Les pères priorisent la vente. Donc, ce poisson n'est pas utilisé en réalité là à la maison. Donc, ce poisson est vendu et pour les, les dépenses courantes de la famille. Ma prenne l'école, elle finit l'école et puis m'a voué la prendre un bagaille, qu'elle va prendre les vivions, m'a donné. Um, students in that video, um, firstly was the use of mid upper arm circumference strips, which I said the one which is like you know red, yellow, and um, green. Uh, the other thing that uh, the uh, mothers were using were the RUTF, all right, those uh, red and white packages, the one which you saw in the earlier video. And the third thing which the community worker mentioned is that uh, yes, the family um, does fishing as a source of income, but they sell the fish. The fish is not uh, consumed by the family members. Um, then you, um, after selling the money which is um, obtained, that is what is used for sustenance and uh, survival. So this is what I'm saying that um, very cannot be judgmental in these cases, but need to appreciate that uh, yes, uh, these are real life challenges which are faced by the world. Right? I think the video is on at the back. Oh yes, uh, my apologies. I'll just yeah stop it. Sorry about that, guys. Okay. All right. So, yes, similarly. Oh, I think the second video started. My apologies. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All sorted. Okay, guys. So, yes. Um, similarly is what I was saying. That when uh, the government was delivering the iron and folic acid supplementations uh, to the um, children in their households, they were encouraged, the guardians and the parents were encouraged not to sell these supplementations, but for the um, girls to actually have them for their sustenance and their well-being. All right. Okay, so now moving further. Now we will briefly look at the impact of COVID on food insecurity. So yes, uh, as I said, that the second most, um, the biggest challenge that the world is facing at the moment is civil war, all right? And impact of civil war on food insecurity. So I would um, like for you to see a um, brief synopsis um, of a video by United Nations in summarizing the impact of war on hunger, all right? So let's just uh, briefly see this video and then we'll um, proceed further with the discussion. Just bear with me, I'll maximize this slide, yeah.
right? So yes, this uh, people with ADHD saved ten hours studying. With Sorry about that, guys. Okay. Yes. So now let me talk about conflict-induced food insecurity in a little bit more detail. First, what does the law say? All right. Law says that deliberately causing starvation and hunger is a war crime. This law is um, sanctioned by the International Humanitarian Law and Article 54 of Additional Protocol 1 to the Geneva Conventions. All right. So yes, we have this big sanctioning bodies out there who have said that even if there's a civil war going on, you cannot starve the people. <coughs> <coughs> My apologies. Lots of <coughs> <coughs> lots of talking. But yes, um, so the law says you cannot starve the people. What is the law in detail? The law in detail says that purposefully starving people is a crime in war, which means that countries should not attack directly on civil objects, civil objects such as objects which are related to food distribution, production, availability of safe water supplies, such as agricultural land, crops, livestock, farms, so on and so forth. Other objects such as medicines, clothing, hospital, bedding, all of this should be provided to the people even if they are in war. But how many of us can say that, yes, this is actually happening? No, it's not, right? So even if there is war, these resources are not being delivered to the people. We have known of cases where the resources are deliberately being pulled back. Even if you have humanitarian aid reaching the conflict-prone area, such as food packages, which are reaching the conflict-prone area, but they are not being delivered to its people. All right? So yes, purposefully causing starvation is not acceptable. Attacking resources which are needed for livelihood and supply is not acceptable but unfortunately these rules are not being followed very clearly in today's war and conflict time let me do a case report on yemen as the video shows that yemen is one of the most um, badly affected conflict prone area in today's time and it has worsened because of the impact of covid as well so what does the data show? Data shows that 66% of Yemenis are facing hunger today because of civil war and because of the impact of COVID. Around 2 million people and 1 million women, they need the treatment for malnutrition, which unfortunately they are not getting. Then epidemiological projections, meaning forecast or predictions, they predict that <coughs> <coughs> I'm so sorry. I just have this really bad tickle going on in my throat. Not the best time when you are actually recording a lecture. So my sincere apologies, guys. All right. So yes, um, I'll try my best to keep up for the last bit of the lecture. Okay. So yes, epidemiological projections shows that um, COVID-19 could affect nearly 55% of the Yemeni's population. All right. And this is very critical, guys, that for the pandemic, 80 to 90 percent of the Yemen food was imported. All right. And now because of COVID, the food import has decreased by 43 percent. And this is when the comparison was done in March 2020 compared to the same month, which is in March 2019. All right. When you have a country which is importing 80 to 90 percent of its food, and you have COVID restrictions and travel restrictions, regulations, which is preventing food from reaching the country. You have food and you have humanitarian food aid, aid resources, which are being purposefully held back 
because of civil war these are the main determinants which are causing food insecurity among yemen um, among yemen right uh, this figure very clearly shows us that many many states in yemen they are facing um, they are facing emergency levels of food insecurity all right and you have the one which are in orange which are facing crisis level of food insecurity then you have the one in yellow which is uh, facing a stressful level of food insecurity the definition to this are we are given in the report and the references have been provided to you but overall yemen as a nation is facing critical and appalling levels of food insecurity all of yemen may it could be different levels but all of yemen is facing food insecurity because of two key drivers covid and the civil war so yes let's talk a little bit more about the key drivers first one is of course the civil war civil war which started in 2014 as in still it is ongoing this has done a lot of disruption to the public services uh blockades restrictions uh, to what is being uh, delivered purposefully as i said food has been not been reaching the people and the community as it should be lots of crime so on and so forth which has led to food insecurity economic shocks as we have seen what has covid done now you have two big parameters in the picture one side you have covid the second side you have the civil war on conflict this has caused increase in food price but purchasing power is not increasing and this gives you a very good example over here yemen has lost its currency value it is highly inflated it is losing on average 19% of its value against the us dollar and just this was in the first half of 2020 when the data was recorded 20% of the yemeni's population unfortunately they cannot afford healthy uh, water for their families all right so yes big economic shocks because of covid because of conflict all right the last one is reduced food reserves so as i said humanitarian aid all right so the world food program for instance is facing a significant funding shortfall the shortfall recently in recent time has been because of covid the world food program needs nearly us dollar 1.97 billion to ensure that food related humanitarian aid can be delivered to yemeni's people in 2022 but because of the funding limitation the world food program has half the food assistance for over 9 million yemenis all right so yes uh, this is therefore an appalling and an unfortunate situation um that therefore i took yemen as a case study as a case report to share with you that when you have an ongoing civil war plus you have the impact of covid this can have great detrimental nutrition challenges on the on the uh, population of the country all right so now let's look at the uh, video over here which summarizes this in quite a bit of um, detail it just it just makes it real you know when you see video um, it just makes this uh, more realistic as to what's happening on the other end what what am i talking about All right, so I'll just play this for you again. Just uh, bear with me. All right, so there is a with this Chrome extension. But no, by we all means, skip this. The civil war in Yemen has claimed the lives of so many civilians, and as the conflict enters its sixth year, the reliance on humanitarian aid is more critical than ever before. The United Nations warns supplies are being cut. or purposely held back as Mike Armstrong reports on top of famine and conflict Yemen is also facing the pandemic There is no part of life in Yemen not affected by what the World Health Organization calls the catastrophic humanitarian disaster For kidney dialysis patients even sitting in the hospital hooked up to the dialysis machine doesn't mean safety As soon as I get here, I face a bigger problem. This man says the machine stops because there's no electricity. The problem is hospitals don't have fuel to run generators. The fuel shortage in Yemen is worsening by the day. 
Prices have doubled and fuel's being rationed. Drivers can spend not hours, but days in line to get their maximum 40 liters per week. How can I work, asks this taxi driver. How can I feed myself and my kids? Now, fuel imports have become a weapon in the six-year conflict. Houthi rebels, backed by Iran, seized power in 2014. They control much of the Northwest, while a Saudi-led coalition supporting the former government controls much of the rest. Well, 70% of the country the country's commercial goods come through a port city on the Red Sea controlled by the coalition. The Houthis say since the summer, even UN cleared commercial ships are being held back as a form of economic warfare. Their response? The Houthis have closed the airport and the capital to UN and humanitarian flights. According to Oxfam, that's meant 200 metric tons of aid can't reach the people who need it. The UN this week called for the immediate reopening of the airport. Well, uh, things are, are very dire. According to this Oxfam spokesperson, the situation in Yemen is worsening by the day. He says civilians have been stuck between two warring sides. 20 million people are now food insecure. In June, 28% of families in the Houthi-controlled areas didn't have enough to eat. Just three months later, that's up to 43%. The aid blocked at the airport is needed desperately. There are many, many people who are in critical need for such assistance, and more delays would mean more people will, will lose their lives. On top of the conflict, Yemen has one of the highest COVID-19 death rates in the world. The Red Cross did open a new COVID-19 clinic in the southern part of the country this week, but testing and reporting are low, and the healthcare system is on the verge of collapse. There's fear many are simply staying home, dying there, and their cases are going unreported. Mike Armstrong, Global News. Refity's Garden. I'm no author, and I sell so, yes, oh, literally uh, thousands of books on Amazon every apologies. single month. Yeah. So, yes, um, students, I hope you can appreciate that when you already have a civil war going on, plus you have COVID, this can amplify the challenges faced in food, security, nutrition, many, many folds than what it would do without a civil war, without COVID. All right. And unfortunately, Yemen has the short stick at both ends with an ongoing civil war and with the rise in COVID numbers. All right, so now let's talk about the most recent crisis that all of us are experiencing in the last month that we have experienced is the potential risk of global food crisis due to the Ukraine and Russia war. So what the epidemiologists are predicting is that if the Ukraine and Russia war goes on, your bread is going to become more expensive. Why? Because Ukraine and Russia, they are the major exporters of cereals and grains such as barley, maize, wheat, and oils such as sunflower oil. All right. So they are the major exporters in the world for these grains and these oils. Now with the war, the food prices of these products will certainly rise if the war does not stop. This is the, say, uh, calculated predictions which are which is made by the epidemiologists all right the food and agricultural organization it has highlighted this index in which it has shown that yes during covid-19 we had had increase in food prices but in the last month there has been a substantial increase in food price in 2022 starting of 2022 and that is because of the ukraine and russia war all right so it has the highest peak it's not that we have never had, um, say, food uh, price prices. When we had the economic depression in 2008, yes, that time we had the food price crisis. We had it because of COVID. But the highest that has been seen till date is now because of the ongoing Ukraine and Russia war. So if the war does not halt and stop soon, these uh, prices and food prices uh, will keep surging on. And as we have already seen the impact on fuel, we all can bear the burden of it, even in Australia, all right? Okay, so these are some simulation modelings that are run by the Food and Agricultural Organization, meaning some prediction equations to um, share with you in simple words, what is going to be the impact on food prices and undernourishment 
due to the Ukraine and Russia war. So in the short term, uh, the prices of uh, commodities uh, such as grains and wheat and oil seeds will grow up. And this will cause an additional 13.1 million people to be undernourished because healthy diets, unfortunately, again, are becoming unaffordable. All right. And in the medium term, which is in the um, time frame of 2022 and 2026, if the war does not stop within this time frame, the food prices of these grains and cereals and oil seeds will keep growing, going up. And this will lead to an additional 11.2 million people being undernourished, right? So here, I hope you can appreciate that uh, these are prediction equations because yes, this is something which we have very, all of us have recently faced in just the last month. But I did want to touch base upon this, that uh, apart from ongoing long-term conflict in a nation such as Yemen, uh, now we have conflicts in nations, which is also going to impact the entire world directly. For instance, in terms of the food price rises, and this is going to be the next new uh, food and nutrition challenge for us which is conflict-induced food insecurity. Unfortunately, the previous challenge which we had was COVID-induced food insecurity. The recent challenge that we will be facing once again is because of the Ukraine and Russia war, which we may face is conflict-induced food insecurity with the rise in food prices if the war does not stop soon. Okay, and this has been summarized up and predicted well. And it is summarized well in this uh, news clipping in this YouTube video. So um, let's have a look at the last video, guys. And you know the crazy thing? I didn't write these books myself. In fact, the Russian invasion of Ukraine could be having a critical effect on the world's food supply. Fox's Kevin Cork has the latest on how the conflict may impact the harvest and shipment of grain across the globe and when a potential food crisis could begin. The war between Russia and Ukraine could have dire consequences on a global scale, threatening food supplies across multiple continents, including Europe, Asia, and Africa. Together, Ukraine and Russia supply roughly one-third of the world's wheat and barley, with Ukraine being the fifth largest exporter of wheat in the world. This is not happening in a vacuum. But the ongoing conflict is preventing farmers from tending fields and stopping ports from shipping these vital necessities, with additional Western sanctions possibly halting Russian grain exports as well. About 30 percent of wheat, 20 percent of maize, corn, and about 80 percent of sunflower oil comes from these two countries. Even though global wheat supplies have not yet been affected, Heads at the International Grains Council say a lengthy war could result in a wheat shortage come July, with countries like Lebanon, Egypt, and Indonesia, who rely on lower-priced Ukrainian wheat to feed their poorer populations, especially hurt. From the beginning of the war, we talked with the economy minister, the prime minister, the central bank governor, to find a new mechanism to expedite the process of finding alternatives to imports from countries such as Romania, Serbia, Hungary, and Bulgaria. And to make matters worse, the war is also driving up the cost of grain over fears of a possible future shortage, putting the once affordable wheat supplies even further out of reach for those who need it most. In Washington, I'm Kevin Cork, Fox News. So, yes, students, I hope you can appreciate that the last bit of this lecture was to highlight to you the potential or the risk of all of us as citizens of this planet facing a upcoming crisis, which is the rise in food prices because of the most recent war, which is Ukraine and Russia. So yes, guys, um, this summarizes uh, my lecture on the most current affairs in global nutrition challenges that we are facing to meet the sustainable developmental goals. And I hope this has given you a good overview about the recent trends of global nutrition challenges and uh, possible solutions which the uh, UNICEF and um, the leaders and champions around the world have expressed is needed to address them. And yes, it was um, 
lovely having this opportunity to share a bit of my um, know-how with you. So I hope this has been beneficial. Hope to see you, see you sometimes in the class um, very soon. Thank you. And thank you, Jericho.